in and more and more people are coming in. This is a very, very popular meeting. And I should also point out that not only is it live, but it's also being live streamed on the uh, social media platforms, uh, YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. So uh, what I would suggest is, as it's live, please do not swear. Um, on the uh, social media platforms, we are going to be monitoring what's being said in the, in the chat and the message facilities. And what we'll do is we'll put your questions directly to Stephen later on. So uh, please feel free to ask questions there as well. And uh, because there's going to be so many people for tonight's event, it's not going to be possible probably to go to everybody's question. So what we'll do in that, uh, in that uh, scenario is we'll try to get a theme and put the theme to Stephen as well. All right. So as I said, we're going to start in about two or three minutes, just making sure that everybody is settled in here in the Zoom meeting and also on the social media. Hopefully you can all hear me and see me. And very soon for those people in Zoom, we might be able to hear and see you soon as well. OK, for those of you who are now joining in the Zoom meeting and you're joining all the time, a warm welcome to you. And uh, sorry if I'm repeating myself to those who are already in the room. But if you want to access and interact with the meeting, if you hover onto your screen, get onto the menu and uh, click the chat facility, which I think is a speech bubble. Um, ask a question and hopefully we'll come to you very soon and you can be putting your question live to Stephen uh, later in the meeting. Okay, so uh, we're going to be uh, starting in a couple of minutes. Um, so just set, we're going to just settle everybody in. And uh, yeah, I see a lot of people already using the chat facility already. So that's good. Thank you. Um, don't know, I, give it a, two, a minute or so, and then we'll start the more formal part of the proceedings. A warm welcome to you if you're watching on the social media. Um, there are quite a few streams going on tonight, um, Facebook, Twitter and YouTube and, and a number of different channels there as well. So uh, we're expecting quite a big turnout tonight. And because it's social media, um, there might be people uh, watching from overseas or who are not necessarily aware of the Jewish community. So I'll be putting a little bit more uh, context in um, uh, for that we would normally use for ourselves. So just give, uh, give us a bit more background about where we're all coming from. Okay, I think I'm getting a few nods. I think we're ready to start. Yes. Yeah, I got a, got a, 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 a I've got the okay from the governor. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, a very, very warm welcome and welcome to Hampstead Synagogue or more accurately, Hampstead Synagogue online. For those of you who are watching uh, on the internet, um, on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube, a little bit more context than we would normally provide, just to, so that you understand where we're coming from. Hampton Synagogue is an Orthodox community based in London in England. We were founded in 1892 and still operate from our original building, or usually do anyway, one of the so-called cathedral synagogues of the United Kingdom. Our parent organization is the United Synagogue, and you can find them at theus.org.uk. We'd like to thank Adrian Powell for making this possible, Haley in the office, and Amanda and Madeline, who are working for us behind the scenes tonight. Our media partner is the Jewish Chronicle, uh, the oldest Jewish newspaper in the world. You wouldn't go far wrong to uh, look at their website if you need to find out about what's going on in the Jewish world. And you can find that at www.thejc.com. We'd also like to th thank Shock Audio Visual uh, for all the technical support and uh, especially Andy Shaw and Leo Mindell. And uh, if we don't give their web address, the lights might go off and the sound might disappear. So I'll do that. And that's Shock Audio Visual, Shock audiovisual.co.uk. Last time I was in a uh, dinner jacket and black tie and I said to you then, well, when am I next gonna be able to wear it? So uh, I thought to myself, well, no, I'm gonna wear my casual gear tonight. Um, this is what I would normally wear if I was playing football or doing the gardening. Um, and, but as things progress in the series, I might end up uh, wearing a, a t-shirt by the end like everybody else seems to be doing at the moment. Uh, my name is Gabriel Herman, and together with Madeleine Abramson, we are co-chairs of the Hampstead Synagogue 
and Madeleine Abramson will be with us later in the meeting. So let me uh, explain that uh, this series is entitled, Where Are We Now? And it really hides two additional questions. First of all, how is the Jewish community faring under the threat of the coronavirus? But perhaps more importantly for us is the second question, what will be the immediate challenge in the post-corona era and how should we best deal with them? So those are the two kind of questions that we will want to grapple with in this series. And uh, I think our guest is going to be well placed to help us answer that question. And so allow me now to introduce our guest. Stephen Pollard is editor of the Jewish Chronicle, a post he took up in October 2008. Before joining the Jewish Chronicle, he was uh, a columnist with The Times, wrote regularly for the Daily Mail, Wall Street Journal Europe, and other newspapers about politics, policy, and culture. In February 2005, he was an expert witness in the US Senate's hearing on pharmaceutical importation and sat on the advisory board of Pfizer Europe. He was also founding chairman of the European Institute for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism and sat on the advisory board of the think tank Reform. Stephen Pollard is the author of numerous pamphlets and books on health and education policy and is co-author with Lord Adonis of the best-selling A Class Act, The Myth of Britain's Classless Society, which was shortlisted for the Orwell Prize. Stephen, over to you. Hi, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, it's a great honor to be here tonight. Um, I was just thinking that the, uh, the joy in a way of being able to do an event without, I don't even have to go upstairs or downstairs. I'm, I'm shielding at the moment, which means apart from the odd visit to, to the loo and uh, the kitchen, I'm basically stuck in the room that you see me in now. Um, since, although on Monday we they relaxed the rules, so I'm allowed to go out for a walk once a day, which is which is rather nice. But the uh, it reminded me of the very first, you know, the contrast of being in my room to do an event. It reminded me of the very first event I did as as editor of the JC. I I'd, I'd accepted an engagement. I think it was the second night that I was in post. Uh, it was to go. I won't name the community, but it was to go to a, a community about an hour and a half or so on the train out of London. And it was in November and it was an absolutely foul evening. It was you know, pouring with rain and I think it was thunder and I had a splitting headache. And the absolute last thing I wanted to do was to go and give a talk somewhere, let alone to have to go on a train journey to get there. Um, and I, I, anyway, I went and I, I got to the event. I got to the, to the shul and within about 10 seconds, my mood changed entirely when I had the most Jewish greeting ever which was not, you know, you've come a long way, would you like a cup of tea? It was, you've come a long way, you must want to use the loo. And I just thought, and it's like suddenly I was sort of back in my mother's house um, and my mood changed completely. Anyway, now all I have to do is, is, is sit in the room to, uh, to, to speak to you. So anyway, that's a, that's a long int introduction and thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Stephen. <laughs> um, you must have taken a long journey from your kitchen to where you are now, but uh, so there are advantages, I suppose. Um, Stephen, if I may ask you a few questions to, to kick off and just remind people in Zoom, please start messaging now and uh, we'll come to your questions as soon as we can, okay? Some uh, industries are particularly hit uh, by the phenomenon of lockdown and social distancing. The media and cultural sector have a vital role of keeping us informed and entertained, but are finding this increasingly difficult at this present moment. How have Jewish institutions in these areas uh, been coping and how long can they survive without revenue? Um, that's a very good question. And in fact, we splashed the paper, we, we led the paper on the, the crisis in, in Jewish cultural uh, institutions, um, I think two issues ago. Um, the Jewish Museum is now online. I mean, it was facing difficulties anyway. They've had to have a, a near one million pound um, emergency bailout from the Arts Council. Um, the Jewish Film Festival, um, Michael Etherton, their director, wrote a piece for us in that issue, um, warning that, you know, in a year's time, we could be facing a very bleak landscape across the Jewish cultural uh, uh, field. Um, the 
Jewish Music Institute. Similarly, you know, they had a fundraiser due, like most organizations, they've had to cancel their, their, their annual fundraising dinner. So they're facing all kinds of problems. And I think that the real problem that cultural organizations face is, you know, and we, I'm sure we'll come on to talk about the, the more general funding issues that are going to, uh, that have already arisen, but the, the, the biggest problem I think that the cultural institutions face is a feeling somehow that, um, you know, in an in a economy where money is going to be even tighter than it was, people are naturally going to want to give a limited amount of money to, um, you know, social care and, 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 and health care and, and those kinds of uh, problems, um, and as if somehow the sort of the great cultural institutions are, um, you know, sort of icing on the cap that we don't actually need to icing on the cake that we don't really need to worry about. Well, you know, they are part of what it means to be Jewish in this country, to be Jewish anywhere. You know, we are, you know, we're the people of the book. We are, um, you know, theatre, for instance. We, we ran a feature uh, last week. It wasn't specifically about Jewish organisations, but it was about the theatre. Uh, given how many Jews are involved in the theatre and how many Jews go to the theatre. Um, and the West End is facing all kinds of existential problems. So I think it's, it's a, you know, it's, there are many, many things that we, we, we have to worry about, but the, the, the whole cultural side of things is, is definitely one of them. Thank you. Um, and of course, as part of the culture is also newspapers, of course, and the yes. newspaper industry has been particularly hit. We were very, very frightened, I think, uh, just before Pesach, the you know, Jewish festival of Passover, to see the possible closure of the Jewish Chronicle and the Jewish yeah. New. And I was, was even more frightened. <laughs> I was even more frightened. You were more, more yes, I suppose, that must be true too. Um, and I suppose without a Jewish newspaper, we would lose a considerable voice, not only to our own community, but how we talk to the rest of the, of the country as well. Um, can Jewish newspapers survive? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a broad, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about the specific Jewish aspect of it in a second, but there's a, you know, there's, there's, there's been a broader trend anyway uh, for small small newspapers, let alone national newspapers, which is that it is a, that the newspaper industry is a dying industry in that, mainly because of advertising. The, 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 the model for newspapers has always been built on, on selling advertising. Well, most advertising, or a lot of advertising is now going online and is not going into newspapers. No newspaper's been able to successfully convert in, in a pure advertising sense, uh, advertising onto their website to be enough to subsidize their existence. Um, so there's, there was a problem that was being faced anyway by newspapers, especially local newspapers and, and the JC is, although we're a national paper in our outlook, you know, we represent a small community. Um, so that was, a, that was a problem anyway, but um, that was turbocharged as it were as a problem by coronavirus. I mean, almost overnight, our advertising collapsed. I don't know the exact percentage, but I mean, for instance, all property advertising, all travel advertising, two absolute, um, you know, fundamental parts of our advertising sales just stopped because obviously nobody was buying property and nobody was going on holiday. So they, no wonder they, they stopped. Um, and that was a that was a huge problem for uh, the JC, just as it's a problem for other newspapers too. So we were in the in the terrible position um, before Pesach of, of, of being liquidated. Um, luckily, uh, a, uh, a consortium, a philanthropic consortium, uh, came to the rescue of the JC. Um, we now have owners who are treating the JC not in, not as a business, uh, although it will be run as a business, but as a philanthropic um, exercise. So they are committed to investing in the future. Um, they've kept on, we've managed to keep almost all of our staff on the editorial side, um, and we will be investing and, and appointing other staff as well um, as we go as we go forward. So from a purely selfish parochial JC point of view, the future is very bright. The future is very rosy. But if you put us in the context of other newspapers, uh, it's a terrible market. And if you look abroad, I mean, the Canadian Jewish news is closed. Other Jewish newspapers are facing problems. Um, it, this is, you know, it, 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 what, what coronavirus pandemic has done is it's exacerbated trends that were already there but it's exacerbated them in a way that is existential in the threat rather than simply um you know for rather than simply speaking it up thank you for that um there was a little bit of an intrigue at the time um we knew who the 
di the new directors of the Jewish Chronicle were going to be, but not necessarily the funders. Um, I mean, wonder, have you actually, have the directors met the funders and have you met the funders? And do we know a little bit about their outlook and will that influence the paper? No, the outlook won't. The, 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 we, we have guaranteed editorial independence. They are, the, the, the uh, new owners are in the process of setting up or are, are, are planning to set up a, a charitable um, foundation, as it were, uh, that will guarantee the editorial independence of the paper. And, uh, you know, this is the fact that I'm still editor. Um, and, you know, there's no way on earth I'm going to change the outlook. I mean, a lot of people are unhappy with, with, with not everybody likes the editorial stance of the JC, but it's certainly the stance that I'm uh, that I stand by. Um, so the editorial independence is, is going to be guaranteed um, as we go forward. Um, and I'm, I'm very relaxed and very confident about the, the charitable intentions of the funders. Okay, thank you. Let's go on to the next question. And, and just a reminder for everybody, please use the chat facility now and book your question in so that we can come to you very soon. Has international conflict declined during the current world emergency? And what has been the experience of Israel with its neighbours? Um, I think those are two separate questions in a way. Um, I'll answer them in the order in which they were put. Uh, has it declined? Well, it, it certainly hasn't got away. I mean, one of the things that frustrated me over the past few weeks is that we are understandably so obsessed with our own uh, crisis that nobody's noticed uh, conflicts uh, between India and, and China, for instance. Um, and similarly, um, I think the story in Hong Kong is not getting anything like the coverage that it really deserves. I mean, what we're seeing is China effectively taking over and, and just snuffing out or proposing to snuff out democracy in, in Hong Kong. I'm absolutely thrilled that the government here has taken a principled stance in, in offering uh, so far to extend the visa uh, time that, that uh, Hong Kong Chinese will be allowed, Hong Kong British uh, passport holders will be allowed to come to, to, to this country. And, and I hope that they will, as has been indicated, that they'll be given a pathway to full citizenship and full rights to, to stay here. But I think um, in a way what coronavirus has done, the focus on coronavirus has masked uh, the fact that there are tensions and there are fights and so on still going on. Um, specifically with regards to Israel, um, if anything, from what I understand from what I've read about, from speaking to people and what I've read about what's going on in Israel, we ran a long story last week in the paper about how tensions within Israel between uh, Jewish Israelis and Arab Israelis, that how tensions uh, are easing because so many, I mean, it works both ways because there are so many uh, Arab Israelis working in healthcare, for instance, um, that a lot of Jewish Israelis are seeing the vast contribution that they make to Israeli society and vice versa. Many Arab Israelis are seeing how Jewish Israelis are um, cooperating with them and are saving lives and that kind of thing. Um, Incidentally, slightly tangentially, it's, it's not quite the question you asked, but um, yeah, we've got a feature in tomorrow's issue of the paper about the astonishing uh, developments that uh, startup technology startups in Israel are coming up with some of them in the fight against uh, coronavirus. And I mean, I, I edited the piece yesterday and I was, I mean, literally my jaw was sort of on the ground with some of the amazing developments that we haven't yet read about in the, in, in the normal press. Uh, so read the JC tomorrow and you'll, and you'll learn about that. Um, and I think uh, there was a very interesting discussion that, uh, that Tony Blair had uh, with the rabbi of Mill Hill Synagogue, I think on Monday night, which we screened on the, on the JC website. And Blair pointed out that the, uh, the, 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 internet, the relations between Israel and, the, and her neighbors, uh, as opposed, uh, in comparison with Israel's relationship with the Palestinians, has changed. Uh, it's done, done a sort of volt fast in the last few few months and years. In that, when he was involved very heavily in in, in, in um, negotiating, at least attempting to negotiate some kind of peace with between Israel and the Palestinians, there was there was sort of a great feeling of hope that some deal could be done. Whereas Israel's relations with her neighbours was still regarded as being um, fractious, to put it mildly. 
Whereas actually the way things are working out at the moment is there's really not much going on between Israel and the Palestinians. In fact, that's a very charitable way of putting it. There's a lot of tension over possible annexation and those kinds of issues. And uh, yet again, Mahmoud Abbas has said that they'll drop all security coordination and various agreements with Israel. Yet, whereas with Israel's neighbours, there's a lot of um, uh, cooperation and a lot of hope um, that Israel is being treated by many of her Arab neighbours in a way that you know, Israel wasn't being uh, dealt with, um, you know, five, five, six years ago. Thank you for that, Stephen. Um, there's a, a very old story that in the, in the early days of the BBC, there was a news broadcast which basically said there, has, there is no news today. And they went yeah. on to the next program. Yeah. And I remember watching a BBC News and a couple of weeks ago, and there was all UK news. There was no foreign news at all. And I just yeah. wonder if because it, they can't get the reporting out, that maybe that's one of the reasons why we don't know what's going on out there. Um, but I think uh, that was a that was a very interesting. Um, oh yeah, I also I saw a little advert for the JC for next for tomorrow's edition. So uh, out in your newsstands tomorrow. Um, one other quick question from me, and then we're going to go to questions from everybody else. Mm. Um, and that's a, another reminder, please do to keep that chat facility going and ask questions. We're going to come to you very soon. What do you consider to be the primary difficulty the community will face in the immediate post-corona era? And what should be our response? Um, well, if I take that question literally, I think the answer is money. I don't think it's that simple um, to, to answer it literally. You know, we, we are now moving into a world where the economy, I mean, who knows? None of us know um, what state the economy or rather how quickly the economy will recover. Um, but you know, I think it's a natural expectation that even those people who are in work, I'm lucky enough still to have a job. Um, you know, even those people who are still in work will be more cautious about spending money. So the economy uh, just, you know, recovery may be uh, slower than, than one might hope. Um, people are stretched for funds. Uh, it's going to be a very bleak landscape. And, you know, you, the, the, the paper has been full the last, you know, two months or so, three months of stories of, of, of Jewish institutions, whether they're charitable, whether they're businesses, whatever, um, synagogues, um, struggling for funding now, uh, let alone in the future. We have an interview, um, I know Jonathan Goldstein is doing one of these talks, I think next week. Um, we have an interview with him in the paper tomorrow in which he says, you know, that he's very proud of the way the JLC has helped raise funding over the last three months, but actually the crucial period isn't gonna be what's happened over the last three months, it's the next three months and beyond moving out of lockdown when people will start moving around and people will have even greater need perhaps for certain services, um, how they will be funded. And I think, you know, to answer your question, what's the primary challenge? It's, it's as simple as that, it's money. There are other challenges too, but the primary one is certainly just gonna be hard cash. Thank you very much. And just, um, you mentioned JLC, just for people's um, knowledge, Jewish Leadership Council. Okay, I think we're going to go to a question now, and we're going to go to uh, to John Reisenstein. And before we do, I just wanted to, to thank him also for his help uh, for, the, for, for tonight's event. Over to you, John. Are you ready, John? Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. And I'm Stephen. Uh, very nice to see you. So the question is, what, what's your prognosis for the EHRC timing and conclusions? Uh, conclusions, look, I don't know. Um, uh, for those who, the EHRC is the Equality and Human Rights Commission, who, in case you aren't aware, um, has been investigating allegations of labour anti-Semitism, that it's institutionally anti-Semitic. Um, there is an expectation, I think, that the results will be out imminently. I mean, we ran a story uh, last year saying that you know, people were expecting the results maybe to come out uh, either before the last election, you know, in Could November, just have five minutes to digest my food? Um, or to... No, no, uh, no. Uh, no, if it's such important. Uh, <laughs> unmute there. Okay. Someone needs to mute their Zoom because I can't. <laughs> um, Right, so we ran a story saying that, um, uh, contrary to expectations, it was going to be about July or so 
when the EHRC reported, well, we're almost in July now. So I think it will be, I think it will be within the next three or four weeks or so. Um, look, I'm not involved. None of us have actually seen what they're going to say. Um, put it this way, I would be, uh, you know, I, I would, if I had a hat in here, I'd eat it. If um, the report does not find that Labour was institutionally anti-Semitic, because on every definition you can come up with, any evidence you can see, um, it's an overwhelming conclusion. I mean, we have spent years at the JC, you know, the last four and a half years, five years, detailing uh, examples of Labour anti-Semitism. Um, it's been a gruelling thing to have to do, but it's been necessary precisely because of the scale of it. And I think uh, it will be astonishing if the HRC comes up with anything else. Thank you very much. Um, we have um, a question coming in on the social media. Um, to be honest with you, I didn't even notice that uh, the, the um, sports page of the JC had kind of disappearing, but uh, yeah. uh, I don't care, quite frankly. I'm, at this period where there's no football has been a godsend for me. But um, the question here is, um, there are over 1,000 players registered who all would have supported the JC sports section, as well as the chairman of the clubs who it consulted would have helped to save this. Is it going to come back or what's, what's the situation? Um, it's a very good question, and I realise there's a great strength of feeling uh, behind the need to have uh, proper sport in the in the JC. I'm, I'm going to be quite coy, uh, simply because what I'll say is, you know, we don't have sport at the moment, not least because there isn't any. Um, but um, but I all I'll say is I'm very hopeful that we will be able to resume having a sports section. I can't commit myself to something. I don't, the last thing I want to do is commit myself to something that doesn't happen, but I am hopeful. Uh, and I'm saying that in a genuine sense, rather than in a politician's answer. Um, I'm, I'm very hopeful that we will be able to resume sport in some way in the, in the JC. Okay, thank you. Um, right, this is a, I've been told this is a tricky question. I'm not sure if it is. How will annexation, annexation affect international support for Israel? Will left parties in the West now move to endorse BDS as a result? It's a, it's a very good question. It may be tricky, but it's a very good question. I mean, I think we've already seen um, uh, you know, politicians who are relatively mainstream, not the kind of hardcore anti-Israel politicians, but some politicians who are relatively mainstream saying that were Israel to annex the the West Bank, they would call for a boycott. So I think, you know, one has to be alive to that um, as an issue. Um, and I, I think it's, you know, it, 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 it's hardly an original observation uh, if I say that, yes, it will, once, you know, there's always excuses to bash Israel. Um, and the, I think it will generate a lot of hostile um, reaction were there to be annexation. Um, I'm, as it happens, I, 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 you know, I, I take the same view that Anshul, our, um, Anshul Pfeffer, our Israel correspondent, takes, who is, Anshul is very, who is also Bibi's biographer, Benjamin Netanyahu's biographer, so he, he's, you know, he's very skilled at analysing these things. Anshul doesn't think there will be annexation, or at least he doesn't think there'll be anything that is remotely resembling it. Um, in his view, uh, Bibi was using annexation effectively as a kind of electoral tool to rally his base and it's something that he's promised before and that he won't deliver it not least because um on the latest reading that, that we're having um the trump administration who have you know been very support whatever one thinks of donald trump and i have a you know very low opinion of donald trump to put it mildly uh, but whatever one um says about him you know he's certainly been supportive of of, of much of what israel's been doing and um, Angel's reading is that the Trump administration is not supportive of annexation, partly because the last thing it wants is to have uh, a Middle East crisis on its hands, um, whilst it's dealing with all kinds of other problems. Um, so let's wait and see. I mean, the, the, the day on which it's supposed to, uh, according to the, the electoral timetable that was promised in, in by, by BB, it's supposed to be the 1st of July. Well, the IDF's been war gaming possibilities over the last week or so as to how they'll cope with it. And as, as Anshul points out in his analysis in the, this week's JC, you know, the, the biggest uncertainty they've got isn't how the Palestinians will respond. It's, it's what 
their own government is what the Israeli government is actually going to do because you know, there are still there's still a very strong sense in which that it may not happen. Thank you very much for that. We have a question from Stephen Feldman from Muswell Hill. Does the range of political opinion across the Jewish community mirror that of society in general, or is it skewed in one direction or another? That's a very interesting question because things have changed. Um, they've changed a lot, uh, I think probably temporarily, as a result of having an unelectable Labour Party um, for the Jewish community, and it was unelectable for the, 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 the non-Jewish community too. But, you know, we had polls of how the Jewish community would vote, you know, which were giving, you know, faintly ludicrous results um, in, in, in any normal sense, in that, you know, it was sort of 80 80 percent of 90 percent of people saying that they uh, would vote conservative um, because they couldn't stomach the idea of Jeremy Corbyn in number 10. Well the Jewish community isn't 80 90 percent conservative far from it you know it used to be said for instance when you know when New Labour was around when Tony Blair was Prime Minister and Gordon Brown you know that we were um, the, the, the Jewish community was sort of um, you know, in some ways, certainly Jewish institutions were far too too sort of pro labour. Um, there was a there was a skew towards that. Um, look, do we as a community mirror society? I think we do. Uh, you know, a lot of the a lot of the um, difference in Jewish communal political outlook, uh, Jewish individual demographic political outlook, isn't because there's anything different about the way people as Jews look at things, it reflects the demography of the Jewish community. So, you know, if you have a community that is primarily urban and is primarily, you know, a lot, in, a lot gathered in some of the suburbs and so on, um, you see the political outlook reflecting the wider political outlook of people who are in those kinds of situations. Um, sorry, that's a very um, badly phrased answer to the question. But what I'm saying is I think there's no particular thing that marks us out as Jews in terms of the way we look at politics. We're just normal people. Uh, and, you know, our politics tends to reflect the way other people uh, think about politics. Oh, yeah, I was intrigued when I watched uh, Schindler's List as a film and wondered whether I was seeing it at the more emotional level than the rest of society and whether or not the Jewish community is much more sensitive to anti-Semitism than the wider society. Um, there is a, an, a question there. And th th that leads into a question that we've got now from Michael. If I can go over to Michael now, please. Yeah, um, Stephen, good evening. There is a proposal for a museum and a memorial to the Holocaust within a stone's throw of Parliament. What is your view, and can you give us an update on the um, expected outcome of that, please? Yeah, um, I think it, uh, my, I'll, I'll answer that in reverse. Um, I think in terms of the expected outlook, I think it's, it, it's happening. It, it will happen. The money's there. Um, the the, the uh, planning commission will be there, I think. Certainly the government's behind it and so on. So I think it will happen. Look, I have to say, I've, I mean, people who... who read the JC um, very, very, very carefully, will have noticed that we've not been as full-throated in our support for it as we are often with other big projects. Um, I do think there is, I have, I have some worries. A lot of people I respect, in fact, almost everyone I respect, um, is very supportive of the idea. And I pay a lot of, cre I give a lot of credence to their views. I do worry about having such a statement uh, of uh, so near to the House of Commons that it will spark a feeling that you know it's the Jews they've got their you know they've got their their thing right next to the House of Commons. I'm I'm almost ashamed of myself for thinking that because one of the things that I've been so impressed by and proud of in the way we've responded to anti-Semitism over the last few years is that we haven't been as a community like we were perhaps 20 years ago. If this, if Corbyn had happened 20 years ago, I think the, the way we reacted would have been typically the, the way British Jews were always caricatured, that we were very meek 
and mild and so on. Um, whereas we weren't at all. We were loud and uh, clear and firm that we wouldn't allow anti-Semitism to be part of mainstream political uh, of mainstream politics. So I'm slightly ashamed of myself for having that thought going through my mind. It's the only worry I've got. I don't have any other worries about it. Um, but I do think I think it will happen. And I think I think on balance it is a good thing. I just have that worry in my mind. Thank you very much. Um, I have, believe we have a question from Jerry Lewis. Jerry? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. Um, you've answered part of the original question I was going to ask you, which was about the independence you have within the JC from your editorial side of things. Would you be able to enlighten us a bit, please, on the background of the new owners? Um, are they in any way politically aligned to any particular group? Um, most of them appear not to be Jewish. Why have they interest in the Jewish Chronicle? There can't be money. What's no, behind them? And also, because of the breakup of the proposed merger with the Jewish News, how do you see the landscape for the two major Jewish newspapers going forward? Can they both survive? Is it a good thing for there to be rivals? Um, or would it have been better for the merger to have at least gone ahead? Thank yeah. you. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Um, so I think separate out two things. The, the consortium that, that, that was um, backing the bid are not all, they're not all um, owners, as it were. They're not all part of the, they're not all donors to the JC. So some of them aren't Jewish, but they have a very strong feeling that the JC should exist. Um, a lot of the donors are philanthropists and they are, all they want to do is give their donations privately and not be part of you know, They're not interested in, I mean, I'll give you complete assurance that there's no kind of political drive that they're not part of any cadre or any pushing anything editorially. They're private donors who wish to give their money privately. And I see no reason why they should be outed publicly for having the public spiritedness to give money to enable the JC to survive. I'm very happy about that, especially as there will be this sort of uh, guarantee under the charitable institution that's being set up of the editorial independence. And I'm, I'm not prepared to, 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 to to um, betray their privacy, their right to privacy. Um, for me, the more interesting question is that second question. Um, you know, I, I'm, a, I, I'm a newspaper person, I'm a media person. Um, I, I hope very much that the Jewish news continues and thrives. Uh, the merger that was proposed and planned was a merger not of um, choice, as it were, but of necessity. Given what I've spoken about earlier, about the uh, the decline in newspaper advertising and the climate for newspapers, the entirely understandable, I was supportive of it, the entirely understandable view was that as two, you know, that a community such as ours couldn't afford to have two newspapers, it was, um, you know, it made little sense in that sense, in a strictly economic uh, way of looking at it. So I thought it made, I agreed with the idea that the two should come together. However, you know, what would I prefer? Like anyone, I would prefer readers to have choice. I think uh, any uh, area is better served by having more people reporting on it. Um, you know, if there's just the JC reporting on the Jewish community, um, you know, it's clearly not going to be as good for the Jewish community as if there were two newspapers. And in fact, you know, let's not be parochial about it. There's also uh, the Jewish um Telegraph in Manchester, which does a, a and Liverpool and, and up north, which does a brilliant job up there. Um, so I think it's really from a, from a from a communal point of view. I think it's really important that we have as many Jewish newspapers as as are feasible. Um, I can only speak about whether the JC is feasible. Certainly, with our new owners, the JC is extremely feasible, um, and we will be carrying on and, and investing and growing. Um, I hope that the same is true for the for the Jewish news. And I think when the Jewish news was taken out of liquidation. That was terrific. 
because let's, you know, the Jewish News does a terrific job. It's a different type of paper to the JC, but it's a valuable paper and it's one that I've always had huge respect for. Thank you for that. Um, I just wonder whether it would be a little bit more democratic for the Jewish Chronicle if it reduced its cover price, because it's, uh, it's quite an exclusive price at the moment. Um, but it, you might have one more reader. Uh, we had a, a, a message for overseas. Can you tell us how they could get in contact with the paper in America? How would they be able to buy it there? The, the best way, if you're abroad, by far the best way to get the paper is to get it on, a, on the iPad edition. You can take out a subscription um, and every Thursday, the paper appears in a kind of facsimile version on the iPad. And that way, it's, it's much the easiest, cleanest way of seeing, of seeing the JC, just as the JC. Um, in answer to your question about the cover price, look, I, I would rather, I want to sell as many copies as possible. I would rather it was a pound, you know? I mean, that, that's, I, I, want to, I want as many people as possible to buy the paper. But unfortunately, you know, we live in the real world and in the real world, it's an expensive business putting out a newspaper. It's very labor intensive. And especially when advertising is falling, when your income is is declining, um, you know we have to try and make we have to make sure that we're sustainable. Um, it, it's all very well me talking about the philanthropic uh, motives of, of of owners and so on, but they don't have limitless pockets. You know we do have to find a way. And unfortunately, you know we we, we resist wherever possible uh, any price increases, but sometimes. Um, you know, the, the, I'm afraid that the cost of the paper is the cost of the paper. And there, there doesn't seem to be, if I'm being brutally honest about it, there doesn't actually seem to be that much relationship between circulation and price. It, it's quite income, it's quite inelastic in that when we put the price up, the circulation doesn't fall beyond um, the trend decline in circulation. We've already lost uh, the Jewish Quarterly magazine by the looks of it, um, and, but we also I also remember that it used to be magazine from the Jewish Chronicle. I'm wondering wonder when we could recreate the Jewish qual uh, Quarterly in the Jewish Chronicle. Well, we do have, we, we have an annual Rosh Hashanah magazine, RH, <coughs> hardly editorially led, and you know, which we're, we're quite proud of. And we're, you know, we're already planning this year's um, Rosh Hashanah magazine. Okay, um, we have a question now from Julian Marks. Julian? Uh, if, if I can't go to Julian, I'll actually read it. I'll try once more. Okay, um, you mentioned the contribution made by Arab Israelis to the coronavirus crisis. Do you see a parallel with the ethnic minorities contribution to the NHS? Um, well, yes, I think that's a very, I mean, uh, it's just, I think it's a slightly different parallel in that, you know, there, there's not, you know, for all that we've seen the, the, the Black Lives Matters protests, um, you know, we don't have the same tensions here uh, between different uh, groups within society as there, you know, historically has been in Israel between Jewish Israelis and, and Arab Israelis sometimes. Um, so I think, you know, it, it's not necessarily a parallel I draw. But to the extent that you know we're all in it together, as it were, I think that's um, that's the same concept. I think that's beginning to um, have some kind of um, impact in Israel as well. Uh, we have a question now about back to the coronavirus and whether or not the behaviour of the Jewish community, perhaps in the Haredi or the so-called ultra-orthodox community, played a factor into this. Um, yeah. Also, I think there's a, a thought that the Jewish festival of Purim. Uh, where there are social parties, etc., might have contributed as well. What are your thoughts about that? I think um, it, 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 it does seem to be the case that early on that Purim did play a part. Um, I think there have been isolated incidents where it tends to be in the strictly orthodox community where there have been some you know, isolated incidents of, of <coughs> pretty silly behaviour. Um, and... You know, at Lagboma, we had, um, you know, there were reports of uh, people out dancing together and so on and not socially distancing. Um, I think it, I think one needs to get it in perspective, though. You know, early on, there was a lot of talk by some people who, who sort of rushed to to look at figures that were actually quite spurious about uh, the, the death rate within the Jewish community being, you know, five, six times, whatever, the death rate for the rest of the population. And early on, the early figures did tend to suggest that. But 
as we had pointed out by um, Jonathan Boyd of the Institute of Jewish Policy Research, that they tended to reflect the fact that where Jews live, the death rate, that the, the incidence of coronavirus was higher. So it wasn't the fact of there being Jewish that made them, uh, that, that, that increased the death rate. It was mainly a, a, a demographic and geographic phenomenon. And we're now beginning to see, I mean, this week, um, I think it's <coughs> Professor Steve Miller at City University, um, has pointed out that if you bring in the figures of deaths, uh, of funerals, beyond some of the figures that the Board of Deputies uses, which is only Jewish burials, if you look at members of the Jewish community who don't have, who've died, but who haven't had Jewish burials, and there are a lot of people like that, actually the death rate, I've forgotten the specific figure, but it's in tomorrow's paper. Um, actually, yes, we are slightly, slightly higher, uh, uh, the death rate in the Jewish community, but it's really not that big a difference. Um, so I think now that, you know, we're beginning to see over the three month period and so on that we've been suffering from coronavirus um actually the early assumptions that there was something about uh jewish susceptibility to it has really i think it was over aimed as a story and it's not the case that's very interesting i think uh, if we look at the coverage of the jewish tribune which is a paper for designed really for the ultra orthodox community yeah. you can see the trauma that's going into that part of the community as they lose kind of some of their religious leaders Yes. Uh, and some of the behaviour of the of the Haredi communities come out, do, uh, do not know quite how to cope with losing the synagogue and all the rest of it. So for big, yeah, great yeah. big challenges. And I also know in the more mainstream part of the community that uh, certain geographic areas that have been hit particularly badly, I was told that Edgeware was one of them. So it, it is very, very interesting. And we can't uh, overdo the, the tragedy which is befalling us at this moment. Um, yeah. I think we have a question now from uh, Sydney. So we're going over now to Sydney. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Thank you for your time this evening. Very interesting. Um, I wanted to ask you, in your view, what do you feel about the, 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 the grassroots organisations that have grown up in, in the Jewish community in recent years? I'm thinking of um, organisations such as the Campaign Against Antisemitism. Um, do you think they are generally beneficial or that their work should be left to the mainstream you know, establishment like the Board of Deputies? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, I think, so, so take, take the CAA itself, the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism. Um, you know, it, it emerged as a result of um, uh, anger, really, at the failure of the then Board of Deputies um, to campaign sufficiently um on these issues and i think that is a good thing that we have these kind of grassroots organizations now you know i i said earlier in answer to a question how you know the, the if the if the anti-semitism problem had emerged that the corbyn problem had emerged 20 years ago our response to it would have been very different and i think partly that was because you know, you've had this whole range of grassroots organisations, Labour Against Anti-Semitism, which is effectively a sort of social media organisation, um, all kinds of other you know, campaign against anti-Semitism, which is very vocal um, and, you know, very uh, firm on these issues. And I think that's all to the good. Um, you know, I, I don't always agree with everything they do. Other people don't, you know, I don't always agree with things the Board of Deputies do or the Jewish Leadership Council does. Um, but I think it's important that there's people out there who are committed and, you know, devoting you know, their own time and energy on behalf of the community. And I think that's, let's, you know, it's always a good thing to try to work together, but it's also important in any walk of life that you have people, especially if you've got, you know, very worthy communal institutions, which we do have, that you also have people, you know, basically metaphorically snapping at their heels. I think that's a good thing to keep people on their toes. Thank you for that. We have a question that came in on YouTube. Uh, 200 Palestinian owned businesses stated to be demolished in East Jerusalem. What can we do to stop this? Um, well, I don't know the details of that specific uh, issue, um, you know, those, those specific businesses. Um, what I would say is, you know, there, there, there's a whole uh, debate that I think is vital 
and necessary about the extent to which uh, the diaspora should be involved in Israeli politics and in campaigning for Israeli politics. I have a slightly uh, nuanced view of it, as it were, in that I think, number one, we have every right, we have every responsibility, we have every duty as Jews to be open about what we think about Israel and Israeli policy. But I also think that Israel has every right and every reason and every, every uh, it's entirely appropriate for Israel to not take a blind bit of notice of what we say. Because, you know, we're not living in Israel. We're not voting in Israel. We're not part of the Israeli political scene. We're not Israeli citizens. And I think I would have just as much uh, anger if, um, uh, you know, my, my cousins, as it were, who lived in Germany or Switzerland or wherever, started telling me how we should behave as, as British citizens. Um, but I think they have every right to say that. And I think we as Jews have every right, British Jews in the diaspora, we have every right to say what we, how we believe. But I also think, I think, I think the, the stance of Marie van der Zyl in not attacking uh, or not making a comment, pro or anti annexation, for instance, I think is entirely right. I think the Board of Deputies is, it's the British Board of Deputies, it's in the title, the clue, it's the Board of Deputies of British Jews, it's not the Board of Deputies of Israeli Jews. Um, and I think she has every right to say, look, this is an issue for Israel, it's not an Israel for me. I'm sure she has her own views on the subject, um, but I think given her role, uh, I don't think she necessarily should have to, uh, to I, I, think, I think she's right not to uh, give us a formal position as president of the Board of Deputies. Thank you very much. Um, so the question that I have to take now uh, from Laurel Herman um, for, from YouTube. Why has Hatch, Match and Dispatch in the JC, that's the, uh, the births, deaths mm -hmm. and weddings, uh, why has that shrunk over the, the weeks and months? Um, it has gone up obviously, for obvious reasons recently. Yeah. But over the week, over the months and years, it has gone down. Why do you think that's happened? It, it's 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 all part of the same trend that everything is going from newspapers online to digital. Facebook is if you want one answer, Facebook is the is is the explanation for that. Um, people no longer uh, feel that in order to announce something, an engagement or whatever, that they have to put it in the JC. Um, you know, I I I regret that for two reasons. One because you know, as, as a, somebody who grew up with the JC, um, you know, I've, I've always looked at those columns with different stages of my life. It's whether the people have got engaged and now it's people who are dying. Um, um, but I also regret it, you know, just the JC because it's, you know, it was an important part of helping the JC to be sustainable. But as a fact of life, it's, 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 it's something that people aren't doing as much as they used to. So it's a straightforward, you know, as I say, to give you one, re one word, as to why it's been like that, the answer is Facebook. I remember asking this of Ned Temko, uh, one of your predecessors as editor, and there were two uh, hatchbacks and dispatches at the front of the paper. Yeah. And, the back, and there was a lot of con consternation about why they should be that's class yeah. defined. And he basically said, "What the reason I can't get rid of it is the most expensive papers, pages in the paper. We can't just afford to get rid of it. But yes. it's change over time, I, I suspect. Yeah. Okay, um, another question from uh, YouTube. Should BDS uh, be categorically condemned as anti-Semitic, or is there room for discussion? Oh, I'm I'm completely uh, unambiguous on that. I think it is anti-Semitic. I mean, I think there's no room for discussion on that. I think if you single out, I, I, I've yet to come across anyone who advocates boycotting Israel, who also advocates boycotting China, boycotting Saudi Arabia, boycotting Zimbabwe, boycotting all kinds of countries that have what they claim to be, you know, what human rights abuses and so on. If you're going to be consistent about it and say that, then fine. I don't think it is anti-Semitic. Um, but I've yet to meet a single person who is consistent like that. What they're doing is they're singling out the world's only Jewish state for boycotting. I cannot see how that is anything other than nakedly, openly, unambiguously anti-Semitic. And I think there's no room for discussion there. It's anti-Semitism, pure and simple. Thank you very much. Um, 
Two weeks ago online, you ran the splash about a very religious man, the late Bobby Hill, not being buried properly because of the renowned coroner in Camden. How can we ensure that our community are buried promptly? Yeah, this is a particular specific issue about uh, the, 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 the coroner there, uh, Mary Hassel. Um, she's already been taken to court and lost. Um, uh, and there was, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago. Um, and we, we, having had a spate of cases about how she was not releasing bodies promptly, um, that seemed to be okay after she, we didn't hear much of it, um, but it seems to have reared its head again, the same problems uh, very recently. Um, how can we deal with it? Well, I think that the, my understanding was that one of the things that, that helped it wasn't just the court case, but that the, the um, I'm not sure what the office is called, but the sort of national coroner, the, the, the coroner in chief, as it were, um, was very uh, understanding of the problems. Um, and I think some pressure was put there. My guess is that that may be one, one avenue or, or, or possibly we may have to resort. You know, we only have one case at the moment of, of, of a similar problem. If it becomes a pattern again, then I think, you know, the JC will get involved, as we did last time. Thank you very much. I think we have a question from John Reisenstein. Yeah, that's from Sue, actually. Actually, it's oh, a bit, I think it's we're, we're, um, we're in double act tonight. Um, I, I'm just interested to hear, especially as we have, what, 46 participants plus YouTube and, uh, and other social media, a crowd that we would be proud of if they all physically turned up to our shul to hear Stephen Pollard in person. Um, what future for communal buildings? after COVID? That, that, that's a very good question. Um, if you'd asked me that question about two hours ago, I'd have given you a different answer and I'll tell you why. So the answer I would have given is a very upbeat answer about how brilliantly things like this have brought people together, how you know, it's important that we build on it and you know, that the, the we learn some of the lessons about bringing people um, who might not want to be involved uh, in terms of turning up at meetings, um, going to listen to things, uh, and who feel that they're much more, in a way, they're almost perversely, they're feeling closer to the Jewish community because they can do things online. That's the answer I would have given you. Um, and I also would have talked about, uh, you know, brilliantly creative things like bat mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs online and so on. Until at seven o'clock tonight, um, the daughter of one of my best friends had her bat mitzvah online and it was all I, I was it was very emotional I was watching it she was doing brilliantly and 18 minutes in YouTube pulled the plug on it no idea why it just suddenly came up with saying uh, this breaches licensing conditions and the whole thing was was brought to a halt and it made me realize that you know yes technology is brilliant and you know we're able to do this and you know I'm able to speak to my mother who lives in Bournemouth every day and you know she's in isolation like I am and it's fantastic that we're together but actually you know there are, there are fundamental problems and there's nothing nothing is as good as actually being together in the same building so I think you know yes learn from all this yes use it it's brilliant it's a fantastic tool but let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater because actually nothing beats proper human contact thank you for that question and uh, uh we have plans to to rebuild our own community center here at Hampstead. and one of the thoughts i had before corona was how to recreate the shabbat experience the sabbath experience for a modern generation and getting people off their mobile phones and actually socializing in the real world was part of the strategy i think it's going to be even more important now um, but I also think that we've also got to take responsibility. If we're going to put new buildings up, they've also got to be partly uh, a solution to the problem that we're going to be out facing, particularly the finance and the economy of the com community and setting up people with new jobs and new businesses as, as yeah. really to get the whole thing started again. Now, I am aware that we're getting close to our hour. So just if, if you want to get your questions in, you've got quite a, a last opportunity now. Um, the I got a question here. Excuse me one second. Yeah, from Angus Bear. How should the Jewish community relate to the Black Lives Matter movement? Um, I think we've done. An, I did a leader on this, an editorial on this in the paper this week. 
Um, and the uh, way I approached it uh, is to look at how, as a community, we dealt with anti-Semitism for the past four or five years. You know, we did our own campaigning. We did our own exposes, uh, exposes. You know, we fought it ourselves. But we were far stronger in doing that because of the contribution of uh, allies in that fight. Um, people who stood with us shoulder to shoulder, who weren't Jewish, but who understood the poison of racism. And I think it's exactly the same in reverse. You know, it's not as Jews that I think we stand in solidarity. It's as people, because racism is, you know, poisonous, is abhorrent, whoever you are and wherever you are. You know, we, in March 2018, we stood in Parliament Square with placards saying enough is enough. Well, I think the same sentiment is true now um, for, you know, for, for, for the black community, whether here, you know, the, the, there's also the, 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 the kind of, you know, double-edged, double-headed monster for black Jews who face racism, you know, two, two types of racism that they face. Um, and I think it's important, as I say, not as Jews, but as people that we stand up in support of, of, of those fighting, uh, fighting anti-black racism. Thank you very much. Uh, a question from Nikki Schaefer. Um, what is your greatest achievement? What are you most proud of as editor of the JC? Oh, you said as editor of the JC. I was going to say my children, but <laughs> um, oh, I'd say, honestly, the thing I'm most proud of is a story that we ran, um, gosh, it was probably 10 years ago. Um, we revealed the fact that um, stillborn babies were being, had been, you know, up to the 1980s, um, had been buried in unmarked graves. Um, and, you know, for many, many parents, I mean, we, we identified over 250. Uh, uh, for many parents, they buried a child, but they'd not, they had no idea where their child was buried and they weren't able to visit their gravestones, uh, at their, their graves. And, you know, number one, we uncovered this and we, you know, we revealed it and we worked, we worked very well with the United Synagogue. It was the US uh, who were responsible for most of this. It's very different rules, you know, very different people. Um, and, and this changed in the 1980s. And the, the, the current US, as it were, I mean, this was 10 years ago, worked with us uh, to, to track down, uh, to match couples with the, with the graves. So, you know, as a direct result of something that the JC did, we were able to give some kind of solace, some kind of closure to over 250 sets of parents who had lost a child and had been unable to visit that child's grave. And, I, you know, whatever else we do, um, nothing else compares with that. So, you know, we've done all kinds of other things that I think are, are important, but really nothing comes close to that. Yeah, I well remember that story. It had a great impact on the community at large. Yeah. Um, would you agree that Mark Regev has done an outstanding job and that he will be a hard act to follow? Uh, yes, <laughs> I think he's been, and we've been, I think we've been very fortunate recently in the caliber of ambassadors from, from Israel here. We've had Mark Regev, Daniel Taub, Ron Prosser. You know, there were some pretty, to be blunt, there were some pretty duff ambassadors sometimes as well. Um, Mark Regev's been, I think, outstanding. I mean, he's, yeah, I think he, he, he's one of those ambassadors who's also been not just ambassador to the court of St. James, but ambassador to the British Jewish community too. I mean, he's absolutely, he's been tireless in the way he uh, turns up at communal events and speaks and so on. I think he's been absolutely fantastic. I do have worries about the mooted uh, or proposed uh, successor, um, Sippy uh, Hotavelli, um, who uh, has nothing to do with her views, which I don't share, but the fact that, I mean, Melanie Phillips has done her column on this in the paper this week. The fact that she seems to have not the least understanding of diplomacy or of how you speak to people who aren't on your side politically. Uh, and she hasn't, I, my understanding is, even though people are assuming she's going to be the ambassador, she hasn't yet accepted it. Um, I sort of hope that she doesn't, because I think he will be a hard act to follow anyway. 
let alone with the wrong person. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Madeline, can I go to you now, please? Hopefully I'm unmuted now, thank you. Um, well, that has been some wonderful questions and excellent answers. Um, I've got lots of people I'd like to thank. Firstly, thank you to our audience for joining us tonight in whatever form that is, Zoom and all the other platforms that we're using. And thank you to our background support team who set that all up. That's Leo Minsky with his help, Dan de Mundell. And uh, also thank you very much to Gabriel who has masterminded this series, Where Are We Now? Thank you to the JC, our media partners. And obviously, thank you very much to Stephen. Stephen, I don't know why I should be surprised that an editor of a national Jewish newspaper can take questions so much in your stride, but you certainly did. And uh, I look forward to reading tomorrow's edition when it actually turns up on my doorstep about midnight tonight mm -hmm. uh, to take up some of those articles that you've already talked about. So thank you very much. Been a pleasure to have you with us. Our next meeting is on is in two weeks. It's actually on Tuesday, Tuesday, June the 16th, when we've got Jonathan Goldstein, who is chair of the JLC. We've mentioned, Stephen has mentioned the JLC Jewish Leadership Council many times tonight. Uh, Jonathan has just been re-elected as chair after his last three-year stint. And obviously the JLC is very involved at the moment in dealing with the charitable sector um, in the light of COVID. And we've addressed questions tonight about how do charities cope from now on. And I'm sure you can have lots of detailed questions to ask Jonathan about that in two weeks time. So we hope to see you again on Tuesday, June the 16th. And I will pass back to Gabriel. Thank you again, Stephen. Really no need because all I need to do okay. is thank you very much to everybody. Good night and thank you for visiting Hampstead Synagogue or more accurately Hampstead Synagogue online. Good night. Bye Good everyone. Night,